Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, your word. I pray that we would be receptive. We would hear it today, that uh, we would uh, allow your spirit, your Holy Spirit, to speak to us and to uh, uh, move in our lives. I pray that this, uh, this sermon will be one we take with us, allow us, uh, allow you to change us. And these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How am I, go how am I doing here? You hear me? You guys hear me back there? Okay. So, we are going to spend a few weeks in a book called Acts, and then we're going to have Back to Church Sunday. We, got a, we have about three weeks here, and we begin by uh, thinking about this. How would you like it, when it comes to God, be the right person in the right place at the right time? Would that be cool, to be the right person in the right place at the right time when it comes to what God's doing? I think so. You know, uh, we all want to be, I, I hate it when I show up to the wrong class, but I've done that before. I don't know if you've ever done that. I remember one time, about three or four years ago, my daughter Zoe, it was before she got married, she decided, you know, Dad, it wasn't enough to be, a, to be educated as a, as a hairdresser or to get a bachelor's degree in counseling. I need to be a nurse now. That's more money, right? Anyway, okay, she said, but, but I have to have two prerequisites, and, they, and I have to get them done before I can get into a school like the, uh, the medical center at the University of Nebraska. She was living here, and so I'm going to try and get these two prerequisites, and they were at LMC is where she found the classes, right? And so she found these classes there, and they, and they said, well, there's no guarantee because most classes are impacted, especially if you're trying to do something like that. They said, but show up, and we'll see what happens. So she shows up, and guess what? The class was full. As a matter of fact, there were, there were 20 or 30 people waiting outside the class that wanted to get into that class. And she was one of them. And they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pass, uh, we're going to ask you to get out uh, index cards, write your name on them, and then if anybody doesn't show up for the class, they decide they're dropping out, we'll, we'll have a drawing. So sure enough, two people weren't there. And so there was two openings, 30 people you know, two openings. And so they gave everybody, no, they just said, get out index cards. So they got out index cards and wrote their name. Only guess what Zoe didn't have? An index card. And so, ooh, that's loud. And so she, she said, and, and, and this girl had some index cards. So she said, here, I'm giving you one. So she gave her an index card. It was pink. And so was the girls, right? So they put these, uh, these in, in a, a box and shake them up. And they pulled out two cards. And guess what color the two cards were? Pink, right. And so she got into the class. Then she got into the other class. Then she went to the University of Nebraska in a, their accelerator program, graduated from a, being a nurse for a year. And now she's working as a, a charge nurse somewhere. She's actually making money. She doesn't have to take anything from us anymore. She was the right person in the right place at the right time. And it all worked out. God does things like that. By the way, if you ever have to do that, get pink cards. It might help you out some. Anyway, the thing is, God, I believe that, that today this message is important because God wants us to know about how to be the right person in the right place at the right time. And so we look, first of all, at the book of Acts. And we start to read the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 1. We're just going to look at the first 11 verses. I think if, you, if we get through the first 11 verses, we'll understand what it means to be the right person at the right place at the right time. And so let's start with verse 1. Here's what it says. The former account I made, O Theophilus. So this guy named Luke is writing this book of Acts. And he says, by the way, remember that other book I wrote, the former account that I gave you, O Theophilus? And so you're going... He's starting out a book talking about another book. But what actually had happened is, is, is uh, uh, Luke had decided to write a book for his friend Theophilus, probably a, a Greek individual that was interested in finding out about Jesus. And he said, I'm going I'm to go back and I'm going to research and I'm going I'm to ask interviews and do questions. I'm going to find out about the life of Jesus. That's going to be my ultimate, uh, my ultimate book. It's going to be my bestseller. And so we went and he, he investigated and he wrote the book of Luke, which was a, bo a book about Jesus from his birth, his life, his miracles, his death, his resurrection. That was the book to end all books. He said, yes, this is going to be perfect, a perfect book to tell about the life of Christ. God, God from the beginning worked up to Christ, right? He, he chose a nation. He worked up to Christ. Uh, uh, and, and all the predictions were, were, were given. And then it happened. And so he told that story even up to the resurrection. But then what he found out later on, he said, wait a minute. Even after Jesus was gone, had risen, he said, God's still doing stuff. I thought that was it, but God's still doing more stuff. 
Uh, apparently, he's not, he's not done now. Apparently, there's, there's a second half. You know how in football there's a first half? And then there's a halftime, and then there's a second. He said, apparently there's a second half. And so I'm going to, Theophilus, I wasn't done. Sorry, I wrote the first book for you, but I'm going to write another one. And so he said, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. That was the former account, right? All the way up to then. After he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. He said, okay, he was taken up. The whole first when Jesus was taken up, and that was after he had given commandments to these chosen people. Do you know what the Bible says about us? We're chosen people. He was talking to some chosen people. There happened to be 11 of them. They were the apostles, minus Judas. And he had given them the command, and here was the command he gave them. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, th baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things which I have commanded you, and I am with you even to the end of the age. That was the commandment he had given. Okay? And so we get, we get 30 words into Acts chapter 1, and it says, He threw the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, he brings up the Holy Spirit. Now, you're going to find out over 50 times in the book of Acts, Luke talks about the Holy Spirit. So up to this point, we really don't know too much about the Holy Spirit. And even as Christians now, a lot of times we're all about Jesus and we're all about the Father, but we don't understand this. Who is this third one? We know, he's, we know the Father, Son, and, and Holy Spirit, but we don't understand. And, and Luke is starting to point out this is going to be critical to the second half, okay? If you're going to understand what you're supposed to be doing, he's talking to these apostles. You need to understand the Holy Spirit. And he first of all says, He through the Holy Spirit, that's Jesus, had given the commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them forty days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He said, he, he, he said uh, you know what happened the last forty days? Proof after proof after proof that Jesus had rose from the dead. He appeared to people. He let people touch him. He ate with people. It, there was no doubt. As a matter of fact, one of the perhaps the, the most uh, uh, proved fact, uh, evidence fact in ancient history is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he said, Jesus rose from the dead. That was presented to all of you. And they said, now I'm going to tell you what's next. Luke says, I'm going to write this book about the second half because the second half is something you need to know. It has to do with the kingdom of God. It has to do with the kingdom of God. And the interesting thing about this is, is Luke recorded all of the book of Acts, all 28 chapters. And then at the end of chapter 28, here's what it says. Very last part of chapter 28. Then Paul dwelt two years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the, gospel, the kingdom of God and teaching things which would concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. No one forbidding him. That's the end of the book. What kind of ending is that? He's just telling, he's going along telling about Paul. He said, no one, forget, no one forbidding him. Then, bam, that book's done. Something wrong with that. You know what's wrong with it? The story wasn't over. That was as far as he lived. He, he had to write, okay, that's the end, but that's not the end. You know, well, he wrapped up Luke. That was good when he wrote that book. But this book is still hanging because the second half that, that he didn't even understand when he first started writing, that his, the disciples didn't understand, is still happening even now. It's still happening. If he, if he was alive, he'd still be writing stuff that was happening. It's still happening. So let's, let's find out a little bit about how it is that we just like the apostles, can be the right people at the right place at the right time. So it says that, uh, that Jesus was speaking in verse uh, th uh, 3 about the kingdom of God. And, and the, 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 four, the 11 apostles that were in Bethany outside of Jerusalem, they were thinking kingdom of God. That has to do with us, Jews. It has to do with Jerusalem. It has to do with God bringing in his kingdom to the Jews. And, and, and Jesus apparently becoming uh, the reigning king. That's what it has to do with. And it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which ye which he have heard from me. And so Jesus says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Guys, all 11 of you standing out here, I do not want you, 
I, I don't want you, I want you to go to Jerusalem, right? And wait there for a few days because the promise is going to be coming. The promise that I told you about. And you remember Jesus, Jesus told his disciples before he was crucified, he says, I've got to go away because the comforter, can, comforter can't come if I leave. And so the promise was the Holy Spirit. And the disciples really didn't have a grasp on it. They didn't have a grasp on the fact that Jesus was leaving. And so he says, he says, don't depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he has said you have heard from me. And then he defines it a little more. He said, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized, and there it is again, with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. And they're starting to think, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're waiting in Jerusalem, and, and, and John baptized with water, and we've all been baptized. You know what it means to ba be baptized, right? You go under the water, and you come back up, and what does that represent? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We're identifying with him. And he said, John baptized with water, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And they were probably thinking, what does that mean? We're going we're, we're, uh, we're to go fall into the Holy Spirit and we're going to come out of the Holy... Uh, and, and they weren't getting the fact that the Holy... It, it wasn't only that they were in the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit was going to be in them. You see, Jesus was done with his actions on earth physically, but he, had a, but he was going to act through the Holy Spirit. He was going to continue to act through the believers. And they didn't get it, but they, they realized, wait a minute, okay, there's a promise that we're going to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And they were starting to get it, and they were probably thinking, you know what, I'm glad I'm here because this last halftime speech that Jesus is giving right now is important. It has to do with something about me being the right person at the right place at the right time. You know, halftime speeches, that's what, you know, when the, if any of you play football, you know, if you're behind at halftime or however things are going, the, 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 the coach will say, look, this is what you need to do. This is how you need to step up. This is how you need to play in the second half. And this was particularly important to Jesus because he wasn't going to be there physically anymore. The Holy Spirit was going to be there. And so it says, uh, therefore, when they, when they had come together, they asked, Lord, why uh, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said, they said, okay, God, are you going to, Jesus, are, are you going to, are you going to, we're going to wait in Jerusalem and then you're going to come in as the king and you're going to restore Israel and, Ju and Jerusalem is going to be, Jerusalem is going to be in charge and they're going to follow Israel and the whole world will come to you through Israel and you being the king here? They, and so did they get it yet? They didn't get it yet. They were saying, what, baptism? I don't know what all this means, but I think Jesus is still going to be here. He's saying he's going to go away for a little bit, but I think he's still... And so they were asking him this. Therefore, uh, excuse me, in verse uh, 7, and he said to them, it is not for you to know the time or the season which the Father has put in his own authority. He says, it's not, listen, you're, you're, getting, you're getting mixed up, you're, you're getting confused. It's not about me establishing a kingdom. God started at the beginning. He chose Abraham. He chose Israel. He chose David. He brought Christ and uh, Christ came through Israel. And there is a future for Israel, but this is, things are changing in the second half. That's all came up to the resurrection of Jesus. And now something new is happening, something called the kingdom of God. It's not the kingdom of Israel we're talking about now. It's the kingdom of God. We know the kingdom of God as what? What is this right here? The church. It's a new age when God works through the church. He worked through Israel, and now it's time to go into the second half. Jesus is giving his final words on earth. And here's what he says. It's not for you to know the time or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you should receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You should receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you should be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus said, look, here's what you need to know. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It's a promise. He said earlier, it's a promise. You know what? We need to know the same thing. We need to know the same thing. God promised that when we put our faith in Him, we receive the Holy Spirit. So there's the promise that we'll have power. And not only that, but we will be possessed by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says you're not your own. You were bought with a price. God lives in you. He was with you, and now He lives in you. So the first thing you need to know if you want to be a, the right person at the right place at the right time is I have the power of God living in me. A lot of times, you know, the, the, this was new for the disciples. 
For us, for, uh, for us, it may not be new, it just may be old. We, we, we learned that, okay, God lives in us, but we, we're not accessing that power. They, they realize, you know what, this means that I can do things because Jesus is living inside me. I have power that I can't make up on my own so things happen like the thing that glory was talking about things happen that we don't expect things happen that others of you gave testimonies about but we only see those things happen when we say i'm going to i'm going to step out in faith and believe that i have this power that makes you the right person because you have the power of god in you this week we had uh, we, we we had our first run through for the dallas uh dallas ranch middle school when we got there Right? We, first of all, I don't know how it was that God prepared it so that we got there. But the, but the principal said, yeah, it's fine. Come here. Pass out the flyers to every student. Talk to every... Principals don't do that. Right? But she did it because God... God was working. Right? And then when we get there, what happened? Janice, we got there and this guy uh, greeted us. He was... Uh, what was he? his job? Head of maintenance. He said, you know what? I'm your, I'm your servant for the next two hours because our staff has been praying for this school and you're the answer to our prayers. And so we're expecting God to do big things. Can I make that happen? I can't make that happen. You can't make that happen. God makes that happen. We step out and God does things. If you know that, if you believe that, you're the right person at the right time in the right place. What does he say here? He says, and you shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, earlier he said you're going to go to all the earth and preach the gospel, right? But I don't think he was telling them go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. I think he was just saying that's what's going to happen. I don't want you. He said, but you're going to be witnesses for me. You should be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And you know what happened? They went back to Jerusalem and started waiting. And after a while, persecution started. And some of them said, we've got to get out of here. This is, tough. This is hard here. So they moved to Judea. And also there was a, there was a famine. And so some of them said, we've got to move out further. So we, they moved to Samaria. And then you know what? Things got bad. And all, all around, they said, we've got to get out of here. And they moved to the ends of the earth. They took out at the, the ends of the earth at that time. And wherever they were... Whether they were in Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria or the ends of the earth, what do you think they were? Witnesses. You will be my witnesses wherever they were at. Now, now, do you think God wants us, since Jesus said you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, do you think God wants us to go back and start at Jerusalem again? Why not? That's where he said to start, right? What he's saying is no matter, he says no matter where you're at, that's where you're chosen to be. And at that point, that's where you can be a witness for me. And how can you be a witness? You can, you can say, God wants to use me to encourage somebody. God wants to use me to challenge somebody. God wants to use me to love somebody. God wants to use me to reach out, to reach, somebody for, reach somebody for Christ. God wants to use me to help somebody have food and a home. God wants to use me right here where I'm at. If you do that, if you believe that God puts you at the place you're at, then you're the right person at the right place at the right time. You know, when I was, uh, when I was in, in um, Pleasanton, I had no plans of coming to this place called Brentwood. But uh, it, it happened that, I, that I, my, uh, I needed some work, and it happened that my daughter lived here, so I said, well, you know, it's as good a place as any, right? So we move in with them in, in Oakley, and uh, I didn't have any plans of uh, coming to the Lighthouse either, but somehow it happened that I'm here, and so you know what I'm, I'm figuring out? I'm the right person at the right place at the right time, because I'm where God put me, even though I didn't expect it. A lot of these, these uh, apostles never moved out of Jerusalem, but God moved a lot of people to the ends of the earth. And you know where we're at? If you think back to where they were then, we're beyond the ends of the earth. They didn't even know about this place called the United States, right? And, 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 and we might think we're, the, we're, we're in, uh, you know, a kingdom of God central, really? But God is, we're where God puts us to do what he wants us to do now. When I was in India, I was trying to tell some people there, hey, look, uh, you know, we're from the United States. And guess what they said back? What's the United States? Right? To so some people, it's the ends of the earth. But if you're a child of God, you have God's spirit living in you. And where you're at is right where God wants to use you. The right person, the right place, 
right time. So he goes on to say this. But you, um, um, or excuse me, verse, uh, verse 8 again. You shall, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit, that's the third time he's talked about the Holy Spirit. We can't afford to ignore him. We can't afford to uh, assume that we, uh, that we understand everything about him, but we know that he lives in us and he wants to use us. The Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, the next verse is very strange, something that happened. I'm just imagine. I'm going to read it for you in a second, but I just imagine it in my mind. When this day is over, these guys go back to Jerusalem, right? Peter's talking to his wife. And he says, you know what happened today? He said, what happened? Well, I, there's a lot of confusing stuff because I think that the, it's not about Israel anymore. It's starting to be about the kingdom of God, and I don't know what that's going to be. I haven't so found it yet. But while we were standing there, Jesus finished up his speech. He said the last thing he was going to speak to, speak to us. We're standing there, and I'm kidding you not. As I was watching, and the other, 11 guys, the other 10 guys can tell you this, he started going up. He started... He just, he, most people don't think it. Yeah, we, we know it, but it's, it, it had to be weird. They couldn't, they couldn't have guessed this. They're standing there, and all of a sudden... It's just, it was like a hummingbird. He just started going up and up and up. And I'm a, here, here's what it says happened. It says, uh, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And a cloud received him out of their sight. You know what? If I was one of those 12 disciples, and you're looking up, and you saw that, that's nothing that's happened before, Right? Jesus didn't do this before. He goes up into a cloud and disappears. I would be, after I, uh, they're standing there looking up, their jaws open, I would say, if we had cameras, I'd say, did you get that? Did you get, I'd just say, hey, did you see what, did you see what I just saw? Because nobody's going to believe me. But they have, they had 11 witnesses there that Jesus went up and disappeared into the crowd. And then all of a sudden, these two guys show up. And I think we've seen these guys before because two guys with the bright uniforms like they'd use Tide Extra Bright, right, showed up when Jesus raised from the dead. There were two guys, obviously angels, that showed up in, in a shining, uh, shiny outfit. And here are these two guys. I don't know if it's the same one, but I bet it is because when Jesus raised from the dead, these two guys showed up and they asked this question that seemed kind of like a dumb question. They said, why, to the, to the women there, they said, why are you seeking the living among the dead? Jesus has risen. And now here again, we see two guys. I don't know if it's the same guys. It's maybe this is their job. Every time Jesus rises up, they show up. And so it says here that these two guys showed up. And while they were looking steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by. Behold, that means like all of a sudden, whoa, here's two men. There was 11 of us out here. Now there's 13. Two men stood by. Um, them in white apparel and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which was taken up from you into heaven will come again in like manner, manner as you have seen him go. He said, look, don't just stand there look, thinking that, okay, he's going to come back now and then we'll take over Jerusalem. No, he's not coming back right now. Don't stand there gazing into heaven. He will come back. This whole thing about Israel will happen. But in the meantime, you got the second half to live. You've watched it up till now, but you've got the second half to live, and here's what you need to do. You need to, you need to expect that God is going to use you in Jerusalem because you're going to be in the right place at the right time, and you're going to be the right person. He will come to you. Jesus will be taken, was taken up, will come to you in like manner as you have seen him go. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the beginning of the second half. It's been 2,000 years now. Since then, it's been over 2,000 years. The story of Acts never ended. It went with 29. If he, was, he, he, would, he would just keep going. Where do you think we are in the half? Where would you put us? In the, in the second half. What? Where we, may be getting in the, we may be getting toward the end. The clock, we know one thing. The clock is running, right? The clock is running. And God wants to use us. And guess what? We have the Holy Spirit. If we just believe Him, if we just trust Him to do things that we can't do by ourselves. It tells us in the Scripture a number of times. In, in Colossians chapter five, 4, verse 5, it says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are on the outside, redeeming the time. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. And it tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 6-9, listen to this. 
by which the world that existed perished, being flooded in water. But the heavens, and now he's, now he's talking about us, but the heavens and earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord... One day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord isn't slack concerning his promise, but, is, but as some count slackness, but he's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He says the clock is running. Redeem the times. The clock is running. And he says, it's getting a lot closer. At some point, Jesus is going to, right now he's saying, wait, wait, don't come back. Or God, don't come back. One more. That time for one more. Keep on. But someday he's going to say, okay, time's up. So what we have right now is our time. And our time is the right time. Because we are the, God's people. We're the right people. The right place at the right time. Just like they were God's people. The right people at the right place, at God's time. So I want to just close with, uh, with something William Durant said, describing this, this uh, early history. He said, There is no greater drama on human record than the sight of a few Christians scorned or oppressed by a succession of emperors bearing all trials with a fierce tenacity, multiplying quietly, building order while the enemy created chaos, fighting the sword with the word. Brutally, brutality with hope, and at last defeating the strongest state that history had ever known. Caesar and Jesus Christ had met in the arena, and Jesus Christ had won. Caesar and Christ had met in the arena. Christ had won with a handful of disciples. With a handful of disciples. Last question I have for you. Are you the right person in the right place at the right time. Let's stand.